Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this Multiple Sclerosis Foundation uh, Zoom conference. We're delighted that you could be with us today uh, for this topic, um, Managing Muscle Spasms and Spasticity, and that will be presented by Dr. Ben Thrower. I'm your host, Casey Minnis, Director of Communications for the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation, and I'll be here to assist Dr. Thrower with taking your questions after his presentation. So let me introduce our speaker. Dr. Thrower is the Medical Director of the Andrew C. Carlos MS Institute at the Shepherd Center. He previously served as the Medical Director of the Holy Family MS Center in Spokane, Washington. Dr. Thrower is also the Senior Medical Advisor for the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation, and he enjoys contributing to our quarterly MS Focus magazine. When Dr. Thrower isn't dressing up as Jack Sparrow the Pirate, he can be found playing with his grandson, Sam. Dr. Thrower, we're delighted to have you to cover this important topic, and I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Casey. And to thank, thank you also to all of the other folks at, at MS Focus who make these programs possible to the sponsors. And thank you to everyone who's joining us uh, this, this afternoon. So we're going to talk about spasticity. What is it? Why is it? What are we going to do about it? And why is it important for people with multiple sclerosis? And, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting topic because it, it sometimes it's a little bit hard to describe. So the actual term spasticity comes from a, the, an old Greek term spastikos, which means to pull or tug, kind of like stretching out a rubber band. If you were to ask an exercise physiologist to give us the scientific definition, it would be the second bullet there. Uh, it's a velocity dependent increase in resistance to passive stretch. So if a person uh, is experiencing spasticity, if I were to move their arm slowly, I might not feel that tightness, but if I were to, to suddenly pull you know, vigorously and quickly, I'm gonna feel that muscle tighten up and resist that, that motion that I'm putting it through. It's a hyper excitability of the stretch reflex, and we'll circle back to what that, that means in, in real life. So there is spasticity and there are spasms. So spasticity is the chronic state of the muscle being too tight. So it's almost a 24 seven sort of symptom. A spasm is more like a cramp. It's a wave of increased tightness in a, in a muscle that, that has kind of a beginning and an end. And it can be quite painful or uncomfortable for people to, uh, to put up with. So spasticity and spasms are a somewhat under-recognized uh, problem uh, in multiple sclerosis. One of the challenges that we have is that some people with MS have a hard time describing it. If we say the word spasticity to someone who's newly diagnosed, or maybe even people who've been dealing with MS for a while, they're not always clear what we're talking about. People use different terms to describe you know, what they're experiencing. They may describe tightness. It may give people a sense of heaviness or weakness. It can be cramping. You can have aching, just any number of different ways that people describe this. Many healthcare providers are not asking the right questions when it comes to dealing with spasticity and spasms. Part of this is just a function of the world that we live in now. We have 22 FDA approved treatment options for, for managing the long-term course with MS. And some of those drugs come with a certain degree of, of laboratory monitoring, safety monitoring, counseling for the individual and their support partners in terms of what we're doing with these medicines. And that takes time to do those things. Sometimes in a busy medical practice, while we're focusing on those immune therapies, it may be at the cost of not spending as much time looking at different symptom issues, including spasticity and spasms. Um, the other challenge is that the signs and symptoms of spasticity and spasms 
fluctuate greatly throughout the day. And, and if any of you are dealing with asbestos and asbestos, you, you can tell us this. A lot of times people are dealing with some of their worst symptoms at night or later in the day. They're doing a little bit better in the morning. Maybe they're really tight when they first get up in the morning and then they loosen up through the day only then to experience an increase in symptoms again later in the day. So again, great fluctuation in the, the nature of the signs and symptoms throughout the day. So the pathophysiology of, of spasticity, so every joint in our body, your fingers, your wrists, your elbows, your, your, uh, your hips, uh, every joint has a flexor muscle and an extensor muscle. And there's normally a balance between those, those flexor and extensor muscles. So that if you're just sitting quietly with your hand resting on the desk, the hand should just sort of be flat, it's relaxed. There are things that we can do that would cause an imbalance between those flexor and extensor muscles. That normal balance of flexion and extension is controlled and monitored through the brain and spinal cord. If we injure the brain and spinal cord, we change that natural balance. And so what the, the, the scales on the bottom represent is sort of how the brain and spinal cord inhibit some of the excitatory activity that, that can occur and lead to sort of this imbalance again. We'll talk about what that looks like clinically and in the real world in just a moment. So normally what the brain does is it inhibits what the spinal cord wants to do. So the spinal cord wants the flexor and extensor muscles to do a certain thing in the arms and legs. And what the brain does is it sends down inhibitory signals and tells the spinal cord, hey, I want you to have a, you know, a, a, a balance between these flexor and extensor muscles. If we injure the brain with multiple sclerosis, with a stroke, with a traumatic brain injury, we take away that inhibitory input from the brain. So we're gonna change muscle tone. We can also change that balance by inhibiting or damaging the spinal cord. So the signal comes from the brain, it comes down to the spinal cord and that inhibitory or sort of balancing response is sent out through something called alpha motor neurons in the spinal cord. If we injure the spinal cord with multiple sclerosis, with trauma, with uh, you know, a, 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 a stroke to the spinal cord, we're no longer able to get that, that signal from the brain down to these alpha motor neurons out to the muscles to have that balance. So what does that imbalance of flexors and extensor uh, muscles look like? So th this gentleman has weakness on the left side of his body. And what you can see is he's carrying his left arm in a flexed position. Spasticity in the arm is flexor in nature. So the wrist wants to bend down, the fingers want to contract, and the elbow wants to flex. So he's carrying his arm in this flexed position because there's an imbalance either through brain or spinal cord injury uh, from the, you know, those, those signals not being able to get down and cause the normal balance. Look at what his leg is doing. His leg is extended. Spasticity in the leg tends, tends to be extensor in nature. So the leg wants to stiffen out. So some of the other signs that we see are hyperactive reflexes. When you go to your healthcare provider and we tap on your knee or we tap on your, your, the crook of your arm at your elbow, we're looking for a deep tendon reflex. And we grade those reflexes anywhere from zero to four. Most people live at about a two. So when we tap on your knee, you get this kind of just nice little, little jerk of the knee. We sometimes talk about people with multiple sclerosis as having get back reflexes. And that's what, what we mean is if we tap on your knee, we better get back or we better hold your leg because that reflex is gonna be very exaggerated, very hyperactive. That's because of that lack of inhibition coming from the brain through the spinal cord to tone that reflex down. On the third bullet there, we have clonus. Clonus is if we grade you at a four on your reflexes. Clonus at the foot, for instance, if we were to push up on your foot, normally it, it, if we push up you know, briskly in someone without a neurological issue, there, there's no, there's no uh, reflex there. In a person with clonus, you get this bouncing motion. And if it's sustained, we call that a, a, a grade four reflex. 
many of you may experience this in the real world. If you get your leg in just the right or wrong position, suddenly your knee is bouncing all over the place. That's clonus. You're causing your own deep tendon reflex, just as if we were tapping on your, your knee, you're making this, uh, this sort of electrical loop fire over and over again. There's nothing dangerous. It's a nuisance. It's curious. If you move your leg in a different position, usually it's going to stop on its own. But that's an ex example of a, of a very, very exaggerated deep tendon reflexes, reflex. Muscle spasms, uh, pain, um, impaired uh, sort of voluntary control. Some people with spasticity will say, when I try to walk, it feels like my foot is glued to the floor. And there's a tendency for us to want to interpret that as weakness when it may not actually be weakness. It may be that extensor tone that's just not letting you voluntarily move that leg the way that you want it to. Uh, to. The infamous MS hug. So when people are you know, first learning about MS and dealing with their, their MS symptoms, the MS hug sounds like it would be something that, that everyone would want. We all like hugs. This is frequently not a pleasant hug. It's a hug that we'd rather not have. So it can be just a tight sensation. It can be outright painful also. And many people will describe it as like a belt around their chest or their abdomen. And this is a form of, of spasticity as well. So we have muscle bands that run in between you know, each of our ribs in these sort of belt-like distribution. And when those tighten up, they can give this constricting uh, sensation. The abdominal muscles can tighten up and give that sort of, of sensation as well. So for many people, the MS hug is a form of uh, spasticity or spasm. So it's odd to, you know, we're talking about an MS symptom that is abnormal. It's not normal neurological functioning. And here we are talking about possible advantages of it. Well, how could this possibly be an advantage? Um, we do sometimes see in, a maintenance of normal muscle tone. So because that muscle wants to be a little on the tight side, it, it is in effect kind of exercising itself. Ironically, it can actually um, help with circulatory function um, because that muscle is contracting a little bit, even sometimes in a leg that's otherwise weak, it, it may actually help prevent uh, deep venous thromboses. Probably the most important potential advantage is spasticity can help with some activities of daily living. This is usually spasticity of an extensor nature in the legs. So if you have weakness in your legs and you go to transfer from sitting to standing, or let's say you know you want to go, you're getting up out of your chair to go to the restroom, and the legs want to stiffen out a little bit, if there's weakness underlying that spasticity, you may actually be using that extensor tone to help with transfers and help with walking. If we do something that takes all of that spasticity away, we may actually impair your level of functioning. So this is where the comprehensive team approach to managing MS is important. We want to sort of get some help input from physical therapists to help guide us as to how much of this spasticity might a person actually be using in their daily activities. One of the, the things that we see sometimes is, is you know, spasticity that can be a help one second and a hindrance the next second. So when someone's transferring to a car, for instance, that increased extensor tone to get from chair to standing into the car can be a good thing. Now, when you're trying to bend your legs to get them folded up and you know, to fit into your seat and the legs won't bend anymore, well, now it's gone from help to hindrance. So, so again, it's, it's, it's quite variable in terms of, of you know, how it affects people. So what are some of the bad consequences uh, of spasticity? So the, the gentleman in the picture has pretty bad flexor uh, spasticity in the upper extremities. You can see his fingers are, are held in a flexed position, his wrists are bent down, his elbows are flexed. Um, so obviously that's not going to be very conducive to using his arm. So it's impairing his mobility, his, his activities of daily living, his range of motion. Um, that can be painful. Yeah, and because sometimes spasms and spasticity are at their worst at night, they can interfere with, with sleep. It can make caregiver uh, help more difficult. So if we have a lot of extensor tone in the legs, for instance, 
when you get a, uh, too much spasticity in the legs, sometimes the legs want to scissor. They want to cross one over the other. If you're trying to do intermittent self-catheterization or just personal hygiene, that makes it tough if the legs are, are uh, not wanting to spread apart at all. So you can make uh, some of these uh, daily activities a little bit more challenging. So some of the things that we see that can actually worsen spasticity, I would say urinary tract infections are, are, are one of the big ones. Anything that irritates your body can worsen spasticity. So things like stress, fatigue, sleep deprivation are big ones, but urinary tract infections are ones that we, is one of the things we don't want to miss. For many people with MS, their, their symptom of a UTI may not be urological. They may not have burning. They may not be able to feel that uh, change in, in, uh, in sensation there. They may have neurological symptoms that are more obvious than their urological symptoms. So if a person with MS suddenly says their spasticity and spasms have ramped up dramatically, we want to keep urinary tract infections in the back of our mind because that's not something we, we want to miss. Kidney stones, periods, uh, abnormal bowel function, again, any of the things on this list can make spasticity and spasms kick up uh, quite a bit. How do we go about managing spasticity and spasms? And so we normally think of kind of a, a ladder or stepwise approach uh, to managing. So starting at the bottom you know, of this, removing noxious stimuli. So everything that we had on that list before, you know, uh, urinary tract infections, you know, abnormal temperature, of, you know, a shoe or a brace that doesn't fit well and it's irritating your foot. Any of those things that are noxious or sort of irritating to your body, if we can get rid of those things, that's our first sort of step in managing spasticity and spasms. Our next step up is gonna be rehabilitation therapy. So getting you in with a physical or occupational therapist or both, getting you into a good stretching program to see if we can help manage and prevent spasticity and spasms. Sometimes that's all we have to do is remove the noxious stimuli, get you into a good stretching program, and that's it. Sometimes we need to go up a notch further and, and look at oral medications. We'll go over some of those options. And then finally, we have intrathecal baclofen or a baclofen pump as probably one of the more aggressive things that we can do uh, to help manage spasticity. So this is sort of the, the, the toolbox that you're working from. And you know, it, there's no one right path for everyone. So we may chick, pick and choose from these different you know, options from, from therapy to medications, to stretching, to you know, managing uh, UTIs and other noxious stimuli. And those, those needs may change for the individual with MS yeah, as time goes on. So some of the goals of spasticity management, we would obviously like to prevent spasticity and spasms up to the point that we don't change your, your activities of daily living. Again, if, if you're using some of that extensor tone in your legs to help with transfers, we want to be judicious in how aggressively we go after that because we don't want to, again, make your legs so noodly that now you're, you're less functional. Uh, so again, improving the functional ability, treating pain, uh, Preventing contractures, that's a big one. So if you have a joint, for instance, that is, let's say it's in the arm and you've had flexion, uh, flexor spasticity for so long that we've not done anything about it, eventually the tendons are going to short, shorten. So it's we can stretch muscles. We have a much harder time stretching tendons. It can be done, but it's a lot more work to do so. So contracture is a shortened tendon that now is, is leaving that joint in, in an abnormal position. We'd like to improve ambulation, tr uh, and facilitate hygiene, um, and help with caregivers uh, to, to you know, take, take their time into account as well. So again, we love our, our physical therapists, our occupational therapists. We get them involved very early on. Um, I think they should be an integral part of your, of your management. Traditionally, they're going to do quite a bit of work with, uh, with, let me move this up here for a second, 
do a bit, quite a bit of work with stretching and send you home with a good stretching program. They might recommend yoga as something that you could do at home. Um, looking at weight bearing, in, especially in someone who's maybe not especially ambulatory, getting people out of their scooters and chairs to help stretch some of those, those muscles. If we have one or two muscles that are giving a person trouble, and we've tried some of the, the other options, we may look at Botox injections. So the trade-off with Botox is we are temporarily paralyzing that muscle. So we have to think about what that muscle is doing for a person um, and make sure that we're not trading one problem for another. You would not want to do Botox in, in say a leg muscle that someone's using to help stand, transfer or ambulate with because you're going to paralyze that muscle for about three months after a, a Botox injection. Serial casting is something that's typically done for more severe uh, spasticity or maybe when you're even getting it to contractures. So serial casting means that we're going to uh, put the joint into a more normal position and put some sort of temporary cast on it to hold it in that position, bring the person back after a week or so, take that cast off because now the joint's in a more normal position, put a different cast on to put it even more normal. So just as you know, a process over weeks to get the joint loosened up in, into a more normal position. Aquatics therapy can be a great adjuvant uh, to, you know, to our toolbox for managing spasms and spasticity. Oops. So two of the simple stretches that I, that, you know, as a non-physical therapist that even I can advise people in doing just to help keep their legs loose. So two of the tighter muscles that we see in the legs are your calf muscles. So that's going to want to point your toes down. Uh, and so we can stretch back in the other direction by doing just a simple towel or band like the, this uh, picture here. Um, so what you want to do whenever you're doing a stretch is be very slow and gentle. Again, remember that spasticity and spasms are velocity dependent. So if I move your muscle or you move it very quickly, you may provoke a spasm. So moving that, that uh, foot into you know, slowly, gently getting it to a point where it's mildly uncomfortable and holding it there for a minute or so. You can also stretch out those calf muscles like the, the, uh, the diagram here, leaning against the wall and just start stretching that calf muscle out. Doing a quad stretch or the runner stretch, you can do it standing or in a, a line position. This is going to hit your your quad muscles on the front of your leg, and you'll feel those muscles stress stretching. So just pulling your heel back towards your bottom to the point where you start feeling those, those muscles on the front of your thigh uh, stretching a little bit and holding it there for a minute can help ward off a lot of problems down the line. This clicker is very twitchy. Um, so another tool that you have in your toolbox, and it's something that's, that's really come on board, I would say in the past few years, is dynamic stretching. So this is where you would go to a facility and say, listen, I'm going to pay someone to really stretch me. Um, so these are not usually physical therapists. They're usually more exercise physiologists or trainers. Um, there's an exercise franchise called Orange Theory that you saw pop up around the United States in recent years, and they were one of the first franchises to open dynamic stretching facilities. So if you were to Google dynamic stretching near me, you'll find somewhere near you that does this. And so what you do is you go in, they're going to spend 30 minutes really putting you through a good range of motion program. And what some folks will do is every couple of weeks, they just go in and get a really good stretch. A lot of athletes use these facilities, runners like uh, you know, going in and get a, getting a good stretch to help prevent injuries down the line. So this can be a nice thing to have in your, in your toolbox. So let's say we're moving up the, the, uh, the ladder now to the oral medications. Uh, we've got our old standby baclofen, which has been around forever. That's usually one of the first things we reach to. Tizanidine is another uh, commonly used medicine. Here we've got a class of drugs called benzodiazepines. So this is your di uh, diazepam or Valium, clonazepam, clonopin, lorazepam, Ativan. 
Um, these are, you know, used as muscle relaxants, also used to treat anxiety. There's good and bad. They're, they are very effective, but they also come with some addictive potential, some abuse potential. Um, the uh, probably not our not something we would reach to for as our first line option. Dantrolene or dantrium is a very old antispasmodic medication. You don't see it used as much in our world, in the multiple sclerosis world, as we do, say, in stroke and spinal cord injury, but it, it can be a useful tool. I can't explain why it doesn't tend to work as well in multiple sclerosis as it does, say, in spinal cord trauma, um, but it, it's still worth keeping, keeping in mind. You know, we mentioned tizanidine. Kepra is something we tend to think of in very limited situations. There is some data saying it can help with spasms. It doesn't tend to help with the chronic spasticity, sort of that, that long sort of chronic state of muscle tightness. But if you're having waves of spasms, it, it can be something that we, we pull out of the toolbox. And then you've got your cannabinoids. So, so this would, you know, people think of medical marijuana. So you've got uh, some FDA approved uh, options. So dronabinol or Marinol is a, is a pill that's used to treat nausea in chemotherapy patients, also used as an apple, appetite stimulant uh, in cancer uh, patients or sometimes uh, in individuals with HIV. Um, it is synthetic THC. Uh, again, it, it, it ha has a place for use. We've got Sativex, and we'll, we'll circle back to Sativex and spend a little bit more time talking about that. That is is uh, an interesting product, and then a whole host of other, you know, uh, smoked, edible, uh, topical cannabis products that are out there. You know, with any of the cannabinoids, you need to really know, be aware of what your state laws are, uh, so that you know what what you might be able to do in your locality. So baclofen and tizanidine, these are, again, our, our oldest uh, medications. The key is to start low and go slowly with these. The, the challenge is you don't want to sedate the person with this. So typically what we're going to do with these medicines is start with a low dose, titrate the dose upwards until one of two things happens. Either the person is happy or sleepy. Uh, so if they can hit a point where they're fairly satisfied with their degree of spasm and spasticity control, we'll leave them on that dose. If they start getting sedated, um, you know, we know we've, we've hit the ceiling and we might have to back off a little bit. Um, we have to be aware that some people with baclofen can actually feel weaker when they're on it. So you may trade increased muscle tone for being noodly. And again, that's, that's not what we're trying uh, to do. We can use the two of them together. They do have different mechanisms of action. Uh, one of the keys with baclofen is you never want a cold turkey off of it. If you're only taking it once a day um, at say 10 to 20 milligrams, you can probably stop that dose or skip it. If you're taking it uh, two or three times a day, we wanna be cautious about stopping it abruptly because there can in theory be a risk of seizures. So cannabinoids, um, so we know that mixtures of CBD and THC, the two most common cannabinoids, can be effective in spasticity management. There's a whole, whole world of literature out there. Um, CBD, uh, hemp-based products are legal in all 50 states, so you can find hemp-based CBD in topical you know, uh, lotions, you can find uh, you, uh, oils, uh, gummies, uh, uh, capsules of CBD. Um, by law, all CBD products in the United States can have no more than 0.3% THC. Uh, some of the products have no THC. I don't think the 0.3 versus zero matters a whole lot. It's a very small amount of THC. Personally, I've not found CBD products by themselves, the hemp-based products, to be especially useful for spasticity management. Um, where CBD tends to be more helpful by itself is things like improving sleep hygiene, maybe for uh, anxiety, but for spasticity management, you probably need to add the THC component uh, to it. So numerous studies have been done. There was a review in 2019 that looked at 14 good studies of uh, uh, THC CBD spray and found reductions of, of anywhere between 42 and 
and of individuals uh, reporting of spasticity and spasms. So the product that they were looking at in that study was Sativex or Nabiximols. Uh, Sativex is a pharmaceutical grade CBD THC one-to-one -one oral spray. It's like a little Banaka blast if you're old enough to remember the, the, those. Um, it's been approved for spasticity uh, and spasm management and multiple sclerosis in numerous other countries, UK, uh, Canada, Spain. Um, so we know it works. Um, we are uh, right in the midst of phase three studies in the United States. The nice thing about having this as, a, as an option for people with MS is it would be FDA approved. It's very, very uh, tight uh, production uh, quality. So it's lab, very, very laboratory tested and insurance will pay for it. So it, it's nice to have one more option out there. Um, Again, we, we know it works. It's just a matter of going through the regulatory hoops. Just again, to give you a, an idea of what that looks like. So we are one of the study sites in the United States. We had to get uh, a DEA waiver to do this study. So THC is still listed as a schedule one drug by the DEA. That means that the DEA lists THC right up there with heroin and cocaine, which is, is scientifically not appropriate. Um, it certainly doesn't have that that sort of you know abuse potential, and it definitely does have therapeutic potential. Um, but be that as it may, until the DEA changes that ruling, we had to get a waiver from the DEA. We also had to get a designation from the state of Georgia to as a research pharmacy. Um, but the between those two uh, regulatory hoops, it, it took a good eight months for us to get up and running with the Sativex study. So if we go one notch up further on the, the, the ladder, now we're uh, gonna take a, we're gonna finish up with intrathecal baclofen. So this is what a baclofen pump looks like. Uh, this would be surgically implanted somewhere on your flank. And then there would be sort of uh, uh, surgical tubing, very fine tubing that runs from that pump over into your lower back to administer a constant uh, very low dose of baclofen into the spinal fluid. This pump uh, holds about three months worth of concentrated liquid baclofen. So what's the difference between baclofen by mouth and baclofen into the spinal fluid? So when we take baclofen by mouth, it goes into our GI tract, it's absorbed in, through the intestines, a certain amount of it is going to go right to the liver and it's going to be automatically degraded. It's what we call the first pass effect. So a lot of the baclofen never really gets anywhere. It's, it's automatically metabolized and excreted. Um, a certain amount of the baclofen is going to cross the blood brain barrier. We really want the baclofen working at the spinal cord level. Unfortunately, when we take baclofen by mouth, we can't guarantee that all of that's gonna work only at your spinal cord. A certain amount is gonna be in the brain itself and that's where you get the sedation from. We're not trying to sedate you with baclofen. We would like it all working at the spinal cord and controlling your spasms and spasticity. Um, and again, we mentioned some of the side effects. So sometimes we get sedation or weakness with oral baclofen before we ever get any control of the spasms and spasticity. Contrast that with the intrathecal baclofen. So we are using tiny, tiny doses because it's going right where it needs to be. So you're literally bathing the spinal cord in concentrated liquid baclofen. You don't have uh, baclofen at, at usual doses uh, intrathecally getting into the, the brain itself. So we tend to not see sedation with intrathecal baclofen. Uh, so a lot fewer side effects. It's a big deal though. It's a surgical procedure. There's certain maintenance that goes along with this. And before someone commits to this, you'd like for them to know that it's going to do what they want it to do. Um, so there's a process that people go through. So you think about who is the right individual. 
you know, you, you talk about the risks and benefits with that individual, and then you're going to send them to a team that's going to do a, some sort of screening test. There are two ways you could do this. You could either just do a one-time injection of intrathecal baclofen through spinal tap into the, and put it into the spinal fluid to see if it does what the individual wants it to do, or you can do a temporary 24-hour external pump. So you put in a little catheter into the, the spinal uh, fluid, uh, have an external Internal, uh, device that's going to deliver the same dose of baclofen uh, that the person would get when they have the pump implanted and see what sort of response they get. If all of that looks good, then you're going to send that person to a neurosurgeon to do the surgical implantation. And then you're going to go into a maintenance phase. So the dose of baclofen can be adjusted as needed uh, when you come into clinic. So this pump is under the skin. You're not going to see any of this. It's all under the skin. There'll be a little tiny surgical scar where the pump was implanted. Right in the middle of that pump is a little access port so that the, the, port, the device can be refilled through just a, a, an injection. There is an electromagnetic security device. So each of these pumps can be ac accessed through a magnet that then sends information back to a laptop computer. So all of your information is in this, this uh, device. So the, the, uh, whoever's doing the pump adjustment can say, listen, I want to increase the dose. I want to decrease the dose. I want to do a safety check on this. And then uh, you're going to come in probably every three months and get that pump refilled. These pumps are generally going to last about five years, the person is going to go in and have just the pump part, not the tubing, the pump replaced on about an every five-year uh, basis. Uh, these pumps are to a certain degree MRI compatible. Generally, we're, we're having people um, get the pumps uh, rechecked after an MRI. You want to make sure the magnet in the MRI did not any, in any way alter uh, the pump function. So if when we see someone in clinic who has a pump and they've had an MRI that day, the nurse, when we're finished with the visit, is going to do something called interrogating the pump. Uh, she's not giving it a, a, a questioning. She's literally using that, that magnet uh, and the security code to make sure the pump is all working appropriately and before we send the person home. Um, so what are some of the advantages? Well, a lot of times you can get the person off of, of some of their oral medications. They are reversible. If for some reason you've done all your due diligence and the person still doesn't like it, they can be taken out. Um, potentially few less sedation. Uh, you're getting away with a lot lower dose of baclofen than you would be if you were taking it by mouth. Um, they are, again, we mentioned this programmable. We can customize the dosing to the individual and they tend to be effective. Again, it's, it's not for everybody. It's, you know, it is a surgical procedure, but in the right person, it can be a, a nice tool to have. Uh, what are some of the, the downsides to it? Sometimes just like with oral baclofen, you can get too much on board. You can get uh, um, weakness or hypotonia. Uh, if the dose is too high, you can still get sleepy. Uh, we do sometimes see nausea, vomiting, headache, dizziness if the dose is too high. Um, rare uh, cases of, of overdose, if we get too much, a person could have respiratory depression, loss of consciousness. Um, extreme cases, it could be life-threatening. Um, it's a surgical procedure. There can be infections associated with that. Um, the pump actually has an audible uh, alarm if the person was due for a refill and they don't show up for their pump refill it starts making a noise it's hard to ignore it we have had situations where someone did ignore it and they had baclofen withdrawal uh, which can be lead to seizures and can be life-threatening if, if you really truly ignore that that uh, refill warning for too long and with that i'm going to turn it over to casey and see what thoughts or questions uh, you folks have Right. Let's uh, let our listeners know how they can ask a question. If uh, you are watching in Zoom, you can ask your question either by using the Q&A button or the chat button on your toolbar. Or if you'd like to ask your question live, you can pre press the raise hand button and I'll ask you to unmute so that you can ask your question live. 
If you happen to be watching us on Facebook, we'll try to get to your questions too. You can just type them in the chat and we will get to them as we can. Um, so let's start with a question from Facebook. Uh, referring to the Sativex study that you mentioned, uh, Jason asks, how does one become a lab rat for this study? <laughs> so if you, um, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov and look under, uh, you could would search Sativex slash multiple sclerosis to see if you, if, if there's a study site near you. Um, the, the, the rough inclusion criteria for this trial is they would like for people to have tried and failed two antispasmodic drugs. So typically people are going to have been on baclofen and tizanidine, maybe dantrolene, and it didn't do what they want it uh, to do. And then we're adding the Sativex uh, uh, to that. It is placebo controlled. Um, you know, my hope is if this trial runs the way most trials do is you know, after the placebo control portion, they'll unblind it and everyone gets to, to be on active treatment. So, but if you start, you could depending on where you're treated, I mean, you can certainly talk to your uh, current healthcare providers. They may be aware of a site, you know, maybe they're participating. If that, if they don't have any knowledge of that, then go to clinicaltrials.gov and that should help you find a site. Okay, and we have a few live questions. Let's see. Uh, Karen, go ahead with your question. You may need to unmute. I did that successfully. There you go. Thank you, Dr. Thrower. I have a, a one question and then a, another mini question. I'm newly diagnosed and I'm trying to understand what spasticity might be in regards to urinary, like to uh, the retention or leakage or I, you know, it's what I'm experiencing is a little bit subtle and um, I, I, it, it's really sort of hard for me to determine whether this is actually MS or something else that's going on. I am under treatment for a UTI right now, but there was hardly any um, bacteria in the sample. It was just given my symptoms that my doctor put me on antibiotics. So spasms and spasticity can sometimes interact with bladder symptoms in, in MS. So we mentioned how UTIs could potentially make muscle spasms worse. Sometimes spasms will make urinary frequency and urgency worse. So I usually, in, in people with the bladder, I usually start though by kind of peeling that off as a separate issue. I mean, the bladder is hugely important uh, in MS. So there's actually an algorithm that we use to manage the bladder. So that we want to know, you know, is your, are your bladder symptoms related to your MS? If they are, what type of bladder issue are you having? If it's if it's not your MS, then getting you in with a urologist to, to you know, could it be say stress incontinence, maybe in, in a woman who's had uh, children, uh, that can certainly you know kind of be an, a non MS related bladder symptom that, that's pretty common. So the the algorithm for managing sorting out the bladder issues in MS is to start was something called a bladder scan. So, so we have the person go to the restroom, try to empty their bladder completely. And then what we want to know is, do you still have urine in your bladder after you think it's empty? The magic number is 100 cc's of urine. If you're below that, we think you may, and you're having bladder symptoms like urgency and frequency, we, we tend to think you're more in the small overactive bladder camp and there are certain treatments that we, that we pursue for that. If you're over 100 cc's, then maybe you're in the poorly emptying bladder camp. So this is the larger, you know, underactive bladder and there's certain sort of pathways we go down there. Recurrent, so a UTI periodically may not mean it could it could be unrelated to your MS. If there are lots of recurrent UTIs, we tend to worry a little bit more about an underactive bladder because there could be urine sitting in the bladder that's just serving as a great place for bacteria to grow. We really want to, to find people that have an underactive bladder because number one, you're at risk for UTIs. Number two, if you really have a lot of urine sitting in the bladder, most of the time, it's not healthy for your kidneys. That back pressure 
can be reflected upstream through the ureters to the kidney and over years and years, it's just not very healthy. So, so you yeah, mention it to, you know, whoever your team is that, that you're having these bladder symptoms. It varies from provider to provider. So here, for instance, we do all of that initial work. We do the bladder scan. We end up managing a lot of the bladder issues. In other practices, they may not feel comfortable with that. They may refer you automatically to a urologist. Either way is fine as long as it just gets managed. Right. So the, the 100 cc's you're talking about is, is what's retained through like an ultrasound. You can see what's left in the bladder. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Um, Okay, I think I probably should have. I'm 66, so I, I, you know, that's also it's just also part of being 66. So I need to figure out though. Yeah. Uh, you know what portion might be MS, and then quickly, lastly, every once in a while, I'll feel like an electrical, um, the twinge, not really painful, but just vibrate in a linearly down in inside my chest. Um, hadn't felt that before. Um, is that MS related? More likely than not, it is. So there are all kinds of weird sensations that people with MS that we sort of call paroxysmal. So they're little transient, you know, oddities. And yeah. that, that kind of electric zap is certainly one of those. If you can reproduce that with neck movement, we call that a Lermit sign. So that, that would tell you, okay, there's a little bit of old demyelination in your cervical spine. You know, your cervical spinal cord is mobile. It's one of the few parts of your central nervous system you can move by with neck flexion or extension. Some people, it just this, that electrical buzz just happens. They're not doing anything. There's no movement that provokes it. Most of the time, it's due to an old lesion, not a new lesion. And for most people, it's kind of curious nuisance. You may find it runs a course for, you know, weeks or months and then just goes away for you. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for your question, Karen. Uh, now we have a question from Elizabeth. She asks, so did I understand correctly constipation can worsen spasticity? Yeah, absolutely. So, so if your bowels are not functioning normally, it's amazing you know, if your bowels aren't right, a lot of things in your body are not going to be right. And then, so, you know, having a regular bowel movement, yeah, it has a lot of positive ripple effects. And so spasticity, again, it, it is very, very sensitive to a lot of different things. It just, just think if your system is off in any way, you're sleep deprived, you're upset, you're under a lot of stress, you're constipated, your spasms and spasticity can potentially get worse. Um, so yeah, try to work on having normal bowel function as, as much as you can, you know, whatever that means. It's adequate hydration, exercise, uh, helps with bowel movements. You know, if, if you need to, you know, up your game a little bit, thinking about fiber supplements. And then if you need more than that, Miralax is a you know, great over-the-counter product. And, and you can use Miralax on a daily basis if, if you need to, just to try to get some sort of uh, normal bowel function going. Elizabeth also asks, regarding stretching, I've heard that prolonged stretching, holding it for two to five minutes or more is needed. Is that true? I know some of the physical therapists do, do like to do a longer stretch. Um, I personally, I've not seen a study to that effect. I mean, I don't think you think you can stretch too much. So you know, the more you can do, the better. And and maybe frequency is also important. Um, I tend to, to you know, sort of preach moderation. So if I can get you to do a minute, I'm pretty happy. But again, you're not you can't do too much. Okay. Now we'll bring on another live caller, uh, Diane. You can unmute and go ahead with your question. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Um, I am a, a support group leader, and I know one of the things my group would ask right away when they hear about the pump, the baclofen pump, is, is it covered by Medicare or is it covered by any insurances? Yes, on both. Yes, on both? Correct. Great. Thank you. 
Great answer. <laughs> Great question. Thank you for that, Diane. Okay. Um, Vicki has a three-part question. Let me read these. Um, she says, is a Charlie horse the same as a spasm? Yes. What is the best way to treat a spasm or Charlie horse? And she adds, I use baclofen cream at night, but it doesn't seem to work on my muscle spasm slash Charlie horse, which happens in the early morning before I get up. Do I need a stronger dose or something else? Yeah, so, so Charlie horse tends to be the, the term that we use outside of neurological conditions, but it kind of feels the same. So anybody can have a muscle cramp. And so, you know, people without MS, you know, no neurological dysfunction, people can wake up in the middle of the night and have a foot cramp or a thigh cramp. And, it, you know, it's rude. It's a, it's a painful way to be, you know, awakened. That technically is a spasm. In a person without a neurological condition, it may be more related to a new exercise program. It could be an electrolyte problem. You, you're relatively dehydrated. Um, we don't think, you know, in in the non-MS uh, population that it's due to the brain or spinal cord. So it's something downstream. But the sensation's the same. So you know, in the midst of a painful spasm, you know, if you can slowly, gently try to you know, stretch that muscle out. Um, it, if you've got someone that can help you with that uh, while you're giving them feedback, again, you want to avoid being quick and herky-jerky with your movements because it's just going to make it that much, much worse. Ideally, we'd like to, to prevent them from happening in the first place. If, so I don't, if you're using a topical baclofen, it's hard to really change the dose very much. So you may need to look at you know, going more to an oral medication. So it could mean doing an oral dose of baclofen at bedtime, an oral dose of tizanidine at bedtime, looking at a cannabinoid at bedtime, you know, a CBD THC product, depending upon where you're at, what your, you know, your, your access is. Um, but it sounds like you, I would also think about your stretching program. You know, if, if you're not doing much stretching, you know, thinking about those those lower extremity stretches that we showed that the calf and the, the quad stretch, uh, maybe, a, you know, a little session of that before bedtime may help head off some problems. But it sounds like we need to do more of something. Okay. We have another question from Facebook. Erica says, I've been on baclofen at night before bed for over 10 years. I'm very weak. Could that be a side effect? And if I want to, how would I taper off? Yeah, so if if you're having you know weakness through the night, so if you're taking a dose of baclofen only at bedtime, it really should be pretty well out of your system uh, when you get up in the morning, let's say eight hours later. So if, if you're having weakness eight hours after a dose and you're only taking it at bedtime, that, that weakness that's after eight hours may be MS and not the baclofen. But if, if you're trying to get up to go to the restroom in the night and you're, you're having trouble with transfers or your legs are noodly, that it could be a side effect from, from the baclofen. Um, and maybe, you know, dropping that dose down to see if it really is the baclofen and maybe adding some, say, tizanidine or something else that doesn't cause weakness might be the, the route to go. So the, the rate of decrease in the baclofen is it's, it's something that's argued about a lot. We have a, a trial coming up soon with a new form of baclofen, and that's one of the areas that people really are arguing about quite a bit. Generally, I mean, you can definitely safely do uh, 10 milligrams a week. Uh, so if, let's say you, you were on 40 milligrams at bedtime, you know, dropping down to 30 milligrams for a week, 20 milligrams for a week, 10 milligrams. And again, what you're going to want to see is, you know, at some point as you're dropping that dose, what are your what are your spasm spasticity do and what does your weakness uh, do and do you do you need to as you're dropping that down start replacing it with something a little bit of something else like a tizanidine okay thank you our next question is from karen she says i got foot drop after having such bad dorsiflexion on my foot couldn't release the spasms i get botox now in my calf it helps a hair any thoughts? My ankle is still swollen from this. Can it possibly be tissue damage? I would 
doubt that it's the tissue damage. So, I mean, you, you do see swelling sometimes uh, from Botox. The other question could be, would be, is the swelling completely unrelated to the Botox and spasticity? Because swelling in the, the feet and ankles is, is pretty common, especially in the weaker uh, leg in people with MS. Uh, your fluid is going to go where gravity is going to let it go. And what gets fluid out of our legs is muscle contraction. So if your muscles are not contracting as much because either you've treated your spasms, spasticity, and there's underlying weakness, you could get some just dependent edema. The fluid is going where gravity is going to take it. So hard to know, you know, is it the injection that caused the swelling or is it now that you're, you're, you're not having as much tightness? This is just normal gravity. Um, sometimes to really treat foot drop, we do have to treat the spasticity first because some of the things we would like to do for foot drop, like ankle foot orthotics, bioness devices, we really can't do if your foot's being driven down into the ground by your spasticity. So this may be a process for you. You're getting rid of the spasticity spasms first may open up a whole world of treatment options for you through a therapist, physical therapist, to, to go after that foot drop now. All right, next we have a question from Michael, who asks, if you have any suggestion for pelvic floor spasms and pain? Yeah, so that's... Uh, so that can be especially bothersome uh, to people. You know, some people, those pelvic floor spasms can affect bowel and bladder function. So really two things that we think about. You know, one would be medications, do our standard, you know, back and cannabinoids, do those help with that? And the second would be getting in with a pelvic floor physical therapist. So, so there are physical therapists who specialize um, in either strengthening, stretching, pelvic floor muscles, they do sometimes on a limited basis work with uh, urologists uh, who can do uh, Botox injections, uh, depending upon what the what the need is. So medications and pelvic floor physical therapists would be the would be the most important tools to work with that. Next, Karina asks, does spasticity ever resolve in MS patients? For instance, I've had episodes of vertigo and they resolved after time and PT post episode. Can spasticity actually go into remission where it's harder to trigger? Yeah, great. That's a great question. And, and, you know, we never say never in multiple sclerosis. You know, the MS does what it wants to do, but it is less likely that spasticity is going to remit. Spasms come and go. Again, you, depending on what's going on in your life, you may deal with periods of time when you have more spasms than others. But that chronic state of increased muscle tone because of the underlying injury to the brain or spinal cord, that's less likely to truly completely remit. Again, it, it's probably gonna wax and wane, but the chances it's gonna go away completely are not great. It does, we, I do fully believe that we are going to see a day when we have neural repair strategies, when we have things that do repair damage in the brain and spinal cord. That's when we can put some of these things to, to, to rest forever. Two people have asked questions about certain supplements. Uh, Karen wonders what your thoughts are on citrate magnesium. And Kevin says that he's noticed a decrease in cramping at night since he was prescribed potassium due to low potassium and is wondering if that can help. Yeah, I mean, so if you have an underlying electrolyte abnormality, I would put in that in that list of that noxious stimuli. So maybe, you know, combined with the injury in the brain or spinal cord, you know, you're, you've got this propensity to having spasms and spasticity. And then if you threw a little bit of hypokalemia or low potassium or a little bit of low magnesium, you know, on board, I think those things could, could certainly trigger in. So, so we should be able to, to diagnose the low potassium. So with the standard labs that we do, you know, a basic metabolic profile or a complete metabolic profile, you're going to look at the potassium levels. We, those basic and comprehensive metabolic profiles don't include magnesium levels. So that would be something we would have to ask specifically. I, I wouldn't recommend that people blindly 
start taking potassium supplements because too much potassium can be an issue as well. You can take a little bit of magnesium without knowing what your levels are. So you could take up to 400 milligrams of magnesium oxide over the counter uh, without risk of hurting yourself. We do that in migraine uh, patients all the time. We try to prevent migraines with just a little bit of daily magnesium. One thing you do have to watch with the magnesium is it can act as a little bit of a, a stool softener. For a lot of people, that's a good thing. So people that tend to be a little bit on the constipated side, you put a little bit of magnesium oxide on board and they're having more regular bowel movements. Uh, we don't want to take that, that thought too far though and provoke diarrhea in any anyone. Right. And let's see, uh, Karen asks, do we have any idea how long the phase three of Sativex will last before the FDA approval? I'm anxiously awaiting its approval. Yeah, the good news is that that spasticity trials are not crazy long, like say, you know, when we do a standard disease modifying trial, like you know, think back in the days of Copaxone and Avonex, beta you know, those trials are always two year trials and then a one year extension. Spasticity trials are not, they're normally like three month trials. Um, so we should get some answers here soon. Um, I, I think, you know, if, if I would say year and a half, thereabouts would not be, you know, uh, unreasonable think about the, it going to for you know, some sort of FDA review. I would be shocked if, if Sativex does not get FDA approval in the United States. Melissa asks, are baclofen pumps available to people on blood thinners? Good question. So, so yes, you would have to coordinate with the neurosurgeon depending upon what the blood thinner was as to, you know, how comfortable they are, you know, like with Coumadin, you know, Warfarin, some of our older blood thinners, there may be a point in time where they want to lower the dose or even hold it for a little bit. So it depends to, us, to a certain degree on the blood thinner, why you're using it uh, and how comfortable the surgeon is, but it's not a, it's not an absolute deal breaker. Right, and we have time for just one more question. We have one from an anonymous attendee that says, can spasticity affect the head and ear area? Sometimes I feel a pulsing and pain in the area and it tends to correlate with when I have leg and arm discomfort from the spasticity. It's a, it's a good question. I mean, in theory, any muscle in the body is, any skeletal muscle is, is you know, a, a potential site for spasticity, it, it certainly wouldn't be a common area. And I would almost wonder if it's if it's something else in the MS family that's being kind of just whatever's driving your spasm spasticity is also having to drive that symptom. So things like neuralgias, so neuralgias, are the, so trigeminal neuralgia is the most common type we see, but there are other variations on neuralgia. There's something called sphenopalatine neuralgia that cause deeper pulsatile pains. Um, I would almost wonder if it if it's if it's some type of neuralgia that then just happens to temporarily coincide coincide with your whatever's driving your spasms. At the end of the day, it may not be absolutely crucial that you, that those things are separated out because you, you could say, well, there could be treatments out there that would cover both bases. You know, maybe ideally you'd like to find one medicine that uh, or therapy that covers more than one symptom. So, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that's a spasm uh, from in the way we traditionally think of it. I wouldn't say it's impossible, but I, I would almost bet it's it's more of a neuralgia. Thank you so much for answering all those questions, Dr. Thrower. And let me just mention to our attendees that, well, first of all, if you didn't get your question answered, you will have another opportunity because our next teleconference with Dr. Thrower will be two weeks from today and it will be an MS town hall. So Dr. Thrower will be taking your questions on anything related to MS treatment and management. So that will be August 10th at 3.30 p.m. Eastern time and you can find the information uh, by following us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 
or subscribing to the Foundation's newsletter, which goes out weekly to tell you about our upcoming teleconferences. If you have questions about how to do that, reply to your registration email from today, and I'll be happy to help you out with that. If you missed any part of today's presentation, you will find the video on our Facebook page, or very shortly it will become available on our YouTube channel. So I'd like to, again, thank you, Dr. Thrower, for the excellent presentation and all the time you took to answer questions. We appreciate you so much. Thank you, Casey, and thanks to everybody else at, the, at MS Focus. You guys rock.